All right, so we've talked about cell division in terms of somatic cells. We've talked about how we make more somatic cells, more skin cells, more muscle cells, etc. Um, there is another type of cell in your body other than somatic cells, and that's gametes. Okay, that's sex cells, sperm and egg. Sperm and eggs aren't produced by mitosis. They're produced by meiosis, another um, cell cycle that is very, very uh, important. It's essential for your body uh, in terms of sexual reproduction. Mitosis was more asexual reproduction. You'll recall that the somatic cells that are formed by mitosis are essentially clones of the, of the parent cell. Well, we're moving in a different direction here in meiosis. When we're producing these gametes, the gametes are um, entirely different from the parent germ cell. And you'll see that as we go through the process and we, we trace kind of what's happening in meiosis. All right, first of all, um, let's establish a working um, definition for meiosis. We're going to call it a two-stage type of cell division in sexually reproducing organisms that results in cells with half the chromosome number of the original cell. So we're, as we said before, we're starting with a germ cell, all right? And in humans, that germ cell is diploid, it's somatic, um, and it has 46 chromosomes. We're going to end up with gametes that have half that number, that have 23 chromosomes. It says the second bullet point, these cells are gametes. Um, in males, these are sperm. In females, eggs, obviously. Um, and those are the, the cells that make sexual reproduction possible. The goals of meiosis. Let's keep these in mind. As we're, as we're going through, we're going to keep revisiting these goals, um, but kind of keep them in the back of your head as we're going through this whole process of explaining meiosis. The first goal is to create haploid sex cells, to create haploid gametes. What's haploid mean? We're going to talk about what haploid and what diploid means. We need to reduce the chromosome number by half. In humans, we need to reduce the number from 46 chromosomes down to 23, or else we have some problems on our hands. And lastly, we need to create genetic diversity. As we said before, mitosis, no genetic diversity. Okay, We move into meiosis, into sexually reproducing organisms. There is going to be genetic diversity introduced into the process. Haploid versus diploid. Here we go. This is a karyotype and it shows all of uh, this organism's chromosomes. Okay, 23 pairs of chromosomes. This organism is, is a male because down here, if you look in the lower right, here are the sex chromosomes with an X and a Y. Y obviously um, notating that this person is a male. 23 pairs, all right? This is the first pair. You can tell that they go together. Uh, if, if I gave these to you kind of all cut up, you could you could potentially, I, ho I would hope, piece them together and know that this one goes with this one and, and this pair goes together. These are homologous pairs, also called tetrads, also called bivalents. All right? And they go together not only because they look alike and not only because they have a similar length, okay? but these banding patterns, the reason these bands, these stripes match up, is because the genes are very similar to one another. For instance, let's pick this little black band right here, okay? This black band matches with this black band, all right? This locus, which is a location of a gene, the genes at this particular locus are homologous to one another. Let's say that this is a gene for a gene for eye color, all right? And this parent, let's say this is the mother, Maybe she's passing on the, the recessive uh, gene for blue eyes, the recessive allele for blue eyes, and dad's passing on a dominant allele for darker eyes. They are both for eye color, but they might be different versions of that trait. Okay, Same if we choose, let's say, this dark gene or this locus here on this chromosome. Okay, Same trait, let's say it's for attached versus free earlobes. The trait is the same. We're still dealing with earlobes. They might be different versions of those traits. Now, this karyotype is from a somatic cell. How do I know that? 
Well, somatic cells are diploid, meaning that they have two versions of every chromosome. Okay, they have one from mom and one from dad. One from mom and one from dad. Two versions of every chromosome. That's diploid. Okay, two versions of 23 is 46. Haploid cells have half that number. They have one version of every chromosome. Sperm cells have 23 version or 23 chromosomes, one of each, okay, and they all happen to be dads. That's how dad passes on his genes to the offspring, okay. Egg cells also have, what, they have 23 chromosomes, one of each of these pairs, all right, and those happen to be mom's versions, and that's what mom contributes to fertilization. If the sperm that fertilizes the egg just so happens to be carrying a Y, that means that the, the developing embryo will be male. Okay, because the, the sperm only has one version of this particular pair. If it has an X, all right, that, that embryo will be female. Okay, so make sure diploid, two versions of every chromosome. Haploid, one version of every chromosome. That's going to be important for us to remember because, after all, remember, we need to create haploid sex cells. We need to reduce from diploid to haploid. Here's a big picture. We know this on the left. Okay, we know that mitosis, we start with a somatic cell with 46 chromosomes. This 2N means that it has twice the number, two versions of every single chromosome. So this, this cell at the beginning of mitosis with 46 chromosomes is diploid. It goes through interphase where everything doubles, we've got 92, and then we end with two diploid cells, 46 chromosomes, just like the parent. Here's meiosis. Remember our goals? First one was to reduce from diploid to haploid. Well, look, we start diploid. As we move our way through, we have interphase. Okay, we have one round of division where 92 becomes 46. And look, we're haploid. One of our goals was to create haploid cells. But what was another goal? Another goal was to reduce the chromosome number by half. Well, we're not there yet. Okay, we started with 46. We are at 46. Even though we're haploid, we haven't reached that other goal, which was to reduce the chromosome number in half. So we have to go through meiosis too. And we have to cut this 46 in half once again to create haploid gametes. There's our single N, which signifies haploid. 2N is diploid. Now we have our, our haploid gametes with 23 chromosomes each. All right, And that was what we really want to do. The third goal was to create genetic diversity. All right, This doesn't explain how we create genetic diversity. Um, it doesn't really explain how we go from diploid to haploid either. But it does show you how we reduce that chromosome number. Okay, It's important that the egg has 23, the sperm have 23, and then our zygote, which then will um, develop through mitosis and, and continue to um, divide and, and differentiate and create different kinds of cells that are you have 46. If we didn't cut this number in half, okay, here's our zygote as we said, this is fertilization, these are going to combine um, to create 46 for our diploid cell. If this didn't occur, if we didn't cut that number in half, all right, if our gametes had 46, our zygote's going to have 92, and aquatic rats have 92 chromosomes. I don't want to be an aquatic rat. I'd rather uh, be a human. So we have to cut that number in half. It's very, very important. We've been talking about differences between mitosis and meiosis. That picture showed you a, a huge difference. Okay, here's another huge difference. Okay, this cell is in prophase one. All right. Now look here. This uh, blue signifies paternal chromosomes, red signifies maternal chromosomes. In meiosis, in prophase one of meiosis, these similarly sized chromosomes are part of a homologous pair. And these are going to come together, just like we saw in that karyotype. Okay? Recall, these go together because of um, their homologous, because of their the, the genes at the particular loci on these chromosomes, at the particular locations on the chromosomes. They come together during prophase one. We're not quite sure how they come together and how they know to come together, but they do. And they do that during prophase one of meiosis. In mitosis, 
these homologous pairs or tetrads don't come together. Okay. Side note, here's a, a vocab term for you. The process of these homologous pairs coming together is called synapsis. Synapsis is when the homologous pairs pair up. Does not occur during mitosis. It does occur during meiosis. So here's synapsis. This guy is going to go with this one. They're going to pair up. They're going to form a homologous pair. These two, they go together. They're going to pair up and form a homologous pair through synapsis. These two are going to come together through synapsis. And remember, once again, that doesn't occur in mitosis. Does not occur in mitosis. Only in prophase one of meiosis. So here we are. Those homologous pairs are present. Here's mom's version. Here's dad's. Here's mom's version. Here's dad's. But in mitosis, they don't come together. Okay, we operate in mitosis with only individual duplicated chromosomes. Okay, and then we pull apart the sister chromatids and we're done. In meiosis, the homologous pairs do come together. Here they are. And then we are operating with these homologous pairs, or these tetrads. First we have to pull apart the tetrads, and then we have to pull apart the sister chromatids. So first we're pulling apart the homologous pairs, then we're separating the sister chromatids. That's why we need two rounds from meiosis. Okay? Very important you understand the idea of homologous pairs. Now, let's go through the whole process of meiosis. It's similar to mitosis, but twice. Okay, we have meiosis 1 to create haploid cells, recall. And then we have to go through meiosis 2 to reduce that chromosome number in half. Interface is the same. Everything still has to duplicate. Okay, we still have chromatin, which is the unorganized, tangled up um, genetic material. We still have our centrosomes with the centriole pairs in them. Now, we enter prophase 1. Recall, lots going on in prophase 1. We have nuclear membranes breaking down. We have the centrosomes with the centrioles migrating to opposite poles. We have them reducing, uh, releasing spindle fibers. Excuse me. During prophase 1, that's when synapsis happens. That's when those homologous pairs come together. Dads with moms, dads with moms, dads with moms. This is a diploid cell. There's two versions of every chromosome. Dad and mom, dad and mom, once again. Okay. Now, in prophase one, this is really, really important. Remember our third goal was to create genetic diversity? Here it is. Here's what happens in prophase one. We have a process called crossing over in genetic recombination. Here's our homologous pair, moms and dads. They start to tangle up. Okay, they start to wrap around one another and they eventually swap portions. So part of dad's genetic material goes on to mom's chromosome and part of mom's vice versa goes on to dad's. So whereas this was a sister chromatid that used to be exactly the same as this one, they used to be twins, now they're different. This one, this sister chromatid used to be the same as this one, now they're different. Now we have four sister chromatids that are all completely different from one another. And by the end, this is going to end up in one gamete. This is going to end up in another, another, and still another. Okay? So we have different gene combinations as a result of this crossing over event where they wrap around each other at a point called a chiasmata and they swap different genetic combinations called genetic recombination. That's happening right here at these chiasmata, at these locations of of interaction. Okay, so from this point on, none of the sister chromatids are the same anymore. They're all different. We have genetic variation. Okay, in um, metaphase one, we're dealing with these homologous pairs in their lineup in the equator. They can be either way. Okay, they can be flip flopped either way. Either mom's is facing this direction or this one. It's completely, they are assorted independently of one another, completely random. All right, this is another source of genetic variation. Take note, we, have, we had our crossing over and recombination. Now we have independent assortment in metaphase one, more genetic variation. We, tend, we go to anaphase one where these homologous pairs or these homologs are pulled apart, one going in each direction. Still diploid, right? Still two versions of every chromosome, still diploid. We move to telophase one. This is our cleavage furrow forming through cytokinesis. Uh, we still have, here's dad's version, mom's is here, 
still diploid, two versions of every chromosome, and then this splits. Now we're entering meiosis two. This is virtually uh, identical to mitosis. Now we're dealing with individual chromosomes. Here's mom's version of this chromosome. Where's dad's? It's not here. It's down to this cell. So now these cells in meiosis two only have one version of every chromosome. So they're not diploid anymore. Now they're haploid. Okay? We've entered meiosis two. The cells are haploid. That was one of our goals, but we're not done because we have to um, reduce that chromosome number in half from 46 to 23. So we're dealing with individual chromosomes. We have the nuclear membrane breaking down because recall it reformed in telophase. We have the centrosomes with the centrioles migrating, spindle fibers being released, grabbing these chromosomes at the kinetic cores and moving them to the middle. You can see they're multicolored because of the recombination. In metaphase two, we have individual chromosomes. In metaphase one, we had homologous pairs. Metaphase two, individual chromosomes. Anaphase two, sister chromatids are being pulled apart towards opposite poles. Anaphase one, we had duplicated chromosomes being pulled apart. Note these differences, okay? And in telophase two, we have nuclear membranes reforming. We have the genetic material uh, stretching back out, and we are forming gametes, and they're haploid with 23 chromosomes in humans. Okay. Now, if this is in males, we're going to end up with four sperm cells. All right, through spermatogenesis. If it's females, we're going to end up with one egg and three polar bodies in oogenesis. And we'll talk about that in another screencast. An overview, and that's it. Okay. Um, just between mitosis and meiosis, D DNA replication occurs in both during the S phase of interphase. How about numbers of divisions? We only had one in mitosis, two in meiosis. We got to, we have to uh, reduce that chromosome number in half. Synapsis, what was that? Recall that was the coming together of the homologous pairs during prophase one. Doesn't happen in mitosis. It does in meiosis. Number of daughter cells in genetic combination or composition, excuse me. We have two daughter cells in mitosis. They're clones of the original. They're ge genetically identical. In meiosis, we have four haploid daughter cells that are different than the original. What's the role of mitosis? In humans, it's growth and repair. Uh, and, and everything is growth and repair, essentially. And in meiosis, we need to produce gametes. Uh, that create genetic diversity and that are haploid cells. So that was a bit long-winded perhaps, I apologize, but hopefully you understand now um, the differences between meiosis and, and why it is so important for sexually reproducing organisms.